turn in your Bibles to the little epistle of 1 John, and we're going to continue our study in this epistle. We're going to look at the first five verses. So tonight, we look at 1 John chapter 5. As you can see, those you don't have to be a Bible scholar to figure it out. We're at the end of the chapter, and we're about to finish this book. Tonight, I'm going to entitle this message... <laughs> a very famous Billy Graham title. Are you born again? First John chapter five, verses one through five. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you've given us life in Christ. You've given us love in Christ and hope in Christ. And yet, Lord, we also know that for many people, they are constantly asking the question, what are you really like? Are you really there? Do you really care? Lord, I know that people all over this great country will go to church tonight or Sunday and they'll wonder if you're there. They'll wonder if they sense your presence. They wonder whether or not you will somehow be able to communicate with them your love and your commitment. And Heavenly Father, again, I pray that in confident faith, we can trust in your presence and your ability to comfort us, but also, Lord, your ability to strengthen us so that we can face the circumstances, no matter what they may be, and so, Lord, again, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. First John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, John writes, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In this final chapter of 1 John, we're given some final tests. We're offered some assurances that are meant to build our confidence and reinforce our trust. To provide for us what the theme of this book has been reiterating in every portion of the book. And that is fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. And so once again we're faced with a question. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be born of God? What does it mean to be born again by God's Holy Spirit. It's prompted people almost in every circumstance and age to ask the question, does belief cause the new birth? Or is belief the result of the new birth? By the way, the verb tenses in this particular section in verses 1 and 2 suggest the latter. In other words, belief doesn't cause the new birth, but rather belief is a result of the new birth. And how do we reconcile that with what we know? And I think that part of the reason is we know, again, that the new birth is a sovereign work of God brought on by the Holy Spirit as he speaks to people, as he draws people. Jesus himself said, no one comes to the Father unless they're drawn by the Holy Spirit, unless in their heart they sense his message, they experience his conviction. For the vast majority of people living in our culture, being a Christian can mean a lot of different things. It can mean growing up in a Christian 
church or some other Christian culture, attending a church, being religious. It was, I think, uh, Billy Sunday, the famous evangelist, who made the popular statement that going to church no more makes you a Christian than par that, that uh, parking your car in the garage makes you a car or going into the garage makes you a car. Those less charitable will say something like, well, I'll tell you what a Christian is. A Christian is a mindless idiot or a mentally ill person who has deluded themselves into thinking that there is a supernatural being when in fact there is no supernatural being. If you think I'm making this up, you can read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, who believes that with all of his heart. The Bible teaches that a Christian is a person who's been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. A Christian is a person who's placed trust and confidence and faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. According to Warren Wearsby, John uses the phrase, born of God, seven times in this epistle. He uses and suggests then that there are attributes, if you will, or birthmarks, we might say, of believers. An apt illustration would be something like, what happened to me right before the service. I was carrying my grandson, Django, not the Django that you're thinking of. This is Django Reinhardt, the jazz guitarist. But I'm holding my, son, grand, my grandson, Django, and somebody said, he looks like you. And I said to Django, insist on an apology. <laughs> you deserve it right now. And I thought, what if this guy's right? What if this kid really does look at me like me? And I'm starting to look at and I go, oh no, poor kid. He looks like his grandpa. <laughs> I've told you the story that when I was at the Cove uh, doing a conference at the Billy Graham Center, and uh, I was doing it with, with Will uh, Graham, who happens to be Billy Graham's grandson and, and uh, Franklin Graham's son, and this little lady came up to him and said, you look just like Billy Graham. And Will goes, my grandfather's 97 years old. Are you saying I look like I'm 97 years old? She goes, no, no, no. Um, you look like a young Billy Graham. And he goes, because I have these great big ears and this great big nose. And she looks at him and goes, well, yeah. It's not unusual that children look like their parents. And John is going to suggest to us that in matters of the spirit, we're the children of God. And because we're the children of God, there's going to be spiritual markers that indicate what it means to be a child of God and, and what a child of God looks like. What are the birthmarks or the character tra traits of, of believers? What we've already learned from 1 John is number one, they practice righteousness in chapter 2, verse 29. Number two, they don't practice sin, chapter three, verse nine. Number three, they love other Christians, chapter four, verse seven. They overcome the world, chapter five, verse four. They keep themselves from Satan. And we might even say chapter four, um, verse, or chapter five, verse five. And also, they keep themselves from Satan, chapter five, verse 18. And when you start to add these characters up, characteristics up, and you say, okay, a Christian certainly involves something about believing something, but apparently being a Christian means something more. There's a way that you live. There's a way that you refrain from living. There's a way, there's a character that begins to be developed inside of you as you love other Christians, as you overcome the world, as you keep yourself from Satan and from satanic influences. And once again, John gives not just simply tests, but assurances the tests in this final chapter include, number one, 
the test of being born again in verses 1 through 5. Number two, the test of believing the apostles witness about Christ, that he's the son of God, part one. And then again, number three, part two in verses 5 through 9. And then there's a final test, a crucial test. Number four, it's the test of living free. From sin in, in, in verses 16 through 21. Again, I'm not talking about sinless perfection. What I'm talking about is living a life where your thoughts and your heart and your affections and your demeanor and your lifestyle isn't dominated by sin. And again, throughout this passage and this book as we've studied it, the reoccurring questions, do you really love God? Do you really know God? Are you born again? How do you know? And so the way that we're going to break this down is we begin at the first part in verse 1. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? In, in verses 2 and 3, do you love God's word and keep God's commandments? And number 3, have you overcome this present world in verses 4 and 5? So again, look with me at verse 1. John writes, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. <clears throat> Before I get into the substance of, the, of that verse, I, in the first century when John is writing this, remember I've already told you he's writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians in the first century. It's probably sometime after 90 AD. He's all in Ephesus. There's a group of, uh, well, there's a man there named Serenthus who opposed the apostle. He denies the identity of Jesus. This, this group of people became known as the Serenthian Gnostics. And these, this group of people, they denied that the individual known as Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. In, in that culture and society, the word Christ means anointed one, the one who's been christened, if you will, or set aside by God for a specific purpose. So John is using the term Christ in the biblical sense of the term, in the fullest sense of the term, when, when he uses the term, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, he doesn't just simply mean the anointed one. He means the predicted one, the anointed one, the predicted one who would come from God, the predicted one who prophetically is revealed in the Old Testament. He means that one who would come from heaven to the earth. And John has already said that he's God in the flesh in his gospel. Remember, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is God incarnate, virgin born into the human family. The incarnation is implied. John isn't simply pointing out the person who makes a creedal confession. He, he's not talking about a person who may have grown up in a religious tradition where they said over and over again, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in the Father, God of God, light of lights, true God of true God, begotten, not made, one with the Father. He's not talking about a person who can recite the Apostles' Creed or, or the Chalcedon Creed or a, a, just simply a creedal confession, but a person who makes a heartfelt declaration that they believe that God sent Jesus as a substitutionary death for sinners and that his death makes a way for sinners to be saved, a way of salvation in which God bestows grace and mercy on the basis of his holiness and justice, which both are completely satisfied in the sacrifice of Jesus. That person, John says, and he's using the perfect tense. And this is what I mean by the, 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 the verb tense here. He's using the perfect tense. He, he's saying they have been born of God as a result, they are children of God. And so when he's making that statement, he's, he's saying 
that there are people who come to a place where they recognize and realize who Jesus is and they are born again. He isn't just simply making a theological statement. It is that, but it's way more. It is a theological statement that results in a relational claim. The relational claim is, he talks about it in the opening chapter of his own gospel of John. He says, to these he gave the right to be called the children of God. If you tell our heavenly father, John is saying, that you hate his child, you can't reasonably expect the father to love you. You love the father. And because you love the father, you love his children. Him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. This is John's way of saying those that God has made born again because they are begotten of him, you love them. He's made the claim again. You love God, you love his children. John is appealing to family love and family relationship. The person who believes Jesus is the Christ is born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a common spiritual paternity. Because God is our Father, we have a common faith. And Jesus is our Lord. And so what he's basically saying is that love and truth unite. The passage literally reads in the original language... Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten of God and everyone who loves the father loves the child. And it's interesting because the child here, it, it, doesn't, it, it isn't an adolescent child or just simply the offspring. It's an interesting word that means the dependent child. In the sense of these are the children who are in fact dependent on God. Begotten of God means God himself has given you new life. Now it would behoove us at this point to think about that word life for just a moment. Because there are two Greek words that are used in the New Testament to describe life. The first one is bios, and most of you know that word because we get the word biology from it. If you've ever studied biology, it's the study of life. But what bios is, is animal life, animate life, human life. So, but then it uses another term, zoe. And zoe is different from bios. Bios is an animated life. And one of the reasons why you know the difference between bios and zoe is bios is the kind of life that eventually comes to an end. If you ever had an animal, a dog or a cat or a pet or a friend or a family member, or you've seen someone born and you see them live and you, you notice that they die. So bios is the kind of life that will come to to an end, it won't last. Zoe is a different kind of a life. It's a life that lasts forever. Now, I, again, it's often used in the New Testament as a euphemism for eternal life. And, and so, again, when the Bible uses the term zoe, it's using a word that describes the kind of life that really is the only kind of life ultimately that there is. And that's the life that comes from God. And the life that comes from God lasts as long as God lasts. And now we begin to understand something. We begin to understand something. And that that the, that, that the life that he's talking about is that this is the kind of life that is imparted to the believer that is in fact the kind of life that only God can give. And it goes back to the theme of the book. Why does God give you this kind of life? It is because he's not simply interested in fellowship here and now but the kind of fellowship that lasts forever. 
And now we understand what John writes in John chapter 17, verse 3, when Jesus prays his high priestly prayer. And he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In other words, this is the kind of life given by God, informed by God, defined by God, based on love. And so, begotten of God means God himself has given you this life. God himself has given you this new nature. Now, again, I want you to think about what John is saying. Have you ever had a person say, you know what? I like you, but your family, I'm not too keen on. I don't like your mother. I don't like your father. I don't like your brother. I don't like your sister. Now, if you say to a father, I don't like your children, or if you say, heaven forbid, that you should say to a grandfather, you know, I think, I don't like your grandkids. <laughs> well, guess what? You just made it almost certain that you're not going to have a relationship with me. See, you laugh, but you understand that. You get that. It makes perfect sense to you now where the Lord says, I don't understand. You say you love me. Why wouldn't you love everyone that I love? And so the Bible makes it clear that being born again is a spiritual experience that's initiated by God's Holy Spirit. It's accomplished under the guidance and the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so we hear the gospel message. We, we respond to the truth. We hear the truth and we believe the truth. Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The righteousness that Paul is writing about is the righteousness that's judicially reckoned to those who believe in the Lord Jesus. And so Paul is making the point that Christians are made righteous by God. You're born again by God. You're made righteous by God. And because you yourself didn't create yourself, and I'm not talking about in the physical sense, I'm talking about in the born again sense, you can't be born again by simply wanting to, going, I want to be born again. Well, what do you mean? I want my sins forgiven and I want eternal life. Well, it's okay for you to want your sins to be forgiven and to have eternal life. But imagine the person says, I want my sins to be forgiven and I want eternal life, but I don't, I don't really want to have a relationship and fellowship with God. And I don't certainly believe in Jesus. And I certainly don't want to be a Christian. Well, see, but, but we laugh, but, but you get it now. In other words, you want all of the benefits of washing and cleansing and friendship and fellowship, but but you don't want friendship with him. This is what is talked about in the Gospel of John. In maybe the most famous chapter in the whole book in the entire Bible. In chapter 3, we find Jesus meeting up with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And in John chapter 3, this man comes to him. It says, a ruler of the Jews by night. And, and he says, this man says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born and Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but can't tell where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. He is using a metaphor of an invisible agent that's acting externally. And you see the results of what happens when this external agent, the wind blows against the tree. You don't see the wind, but you see the tree swaying back and forth. You don't don't see the Holy Spirit come into your life. You don't see the transformation that takes place within. You don't see the spiritual birth that takes place inside of you. But Jesus says it's true. There's another word that's often used to describe this born again experience. It's called regeneration. And so being born again describes that birth. But the Bible says that this birth is real, but it's also necessary. A person will never see John 3, 3 or enter John 3, 5, the kingdom of God. You won't be able to see. You won't be able to enter. Now, again, most of you in here should be able to differentiate or delineate or define, if you will, a life before you came to Christ and a life after you came to Christ. The new birth is a spiritual birth where the spirit is the giver of life. The new birth isn't simply acknowledging the fact that God exists. It isn't simply acknowledging the historical reality of Jesus. It's not even waking up one morning and you decide, you know what, I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to go to church. I'm, I'm going to stop drinking, drugging. I'm going to stop being a weird, stupid person. And I'm going to be a good and decent person. The, tr the tragedy, of course, is there are a lot of born-again people who still do weird and stupid things. So does being born again mean absent weirdness or stupidity? Not always. It's an actual creation. It's a brand new life. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The world, word creation that's used there is the same word we get our word species from. It means a new life form distinct from and separate from any other life form that used to exist. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's the impartation of a new nature. Second Peter talks about it in Second Peter in, in Second Peter chapter one verse four says, "By which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." Paul describes this person as a new man in Ephesians 4.24 and that you've put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new birth takes place by the will of God, James 1.18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. It is necessary it is real. It is according to the will of God. And Jesus gives you the power to be born again. But he also gives you the right. What, what do I mean by that? The right. And that is that you don't have to remain in sin. And you don't have to remain in rebellion. And you don't have to remain estranged from God. And you can be given the power that you need. That's what it says in John 1 12, where it says, but as many as received him to them, he, that is God gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were not born, who were born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of men, but of God. So the new birth is a spiritual birth. And I'm going to suggest to you that the new birth is also a definite experience. And that the new birth results in a new life. And so the born again person begins to conduct himself or herself in righteous living, not practicing sin, loving each other, overcoming the world, possessing the divine seed or nature. A person who loves God will love other believers 
according to John, his argument because we share a common spirit and we share a common Lord and we share a common destiny. Our brothers and sisters are those who share our Lord Jesus. Ray Stedman says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Lord, his supreme concern and authority for his life, the one around whom his life is built, that person is in the family, unquote. Most children, I should say, most parents love their children. We understand that there are exceptions to the rule. On my fourth birthday, my, my parents gave me an abandoned refrigerator. You know, this is not a smart thing to give to a child. It took days for my dad to finally take that refrigerator door off. Let me be blunt. It, it's sort of like that tired story that uh, Rodney Dangerfield used to say, you know, about not getting any respect. And, you know, he talks about going to the beach and he, he gets separated from his parents. He finds a police officer and he says, please, sir, can you help me find my, my parents? And the police officer looks at him and goes, I don't know, kid, there's a lot of places they could hide. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really build up your self-esteem. Most parents love their children. And the point that John is making is that when you're born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are loved. You're a part of the forever family. You know, I read a tragic story of a 36-year-old mother who was discovered to be in the advanced stages of terminal cancer. And one doctor advised her to spend what was left of what was certainly going to be a very short life on the beach at Acapulco. A second physician offered her hope of living two to four more years, but there would be the grueling side effects of chemotherapy and radiation treatment. And she penned these words to her three small children. I've chosen to survive for you, she wrote. This has some horrible costs, including pain, loss of my good humor, moods that I probably won't be able to control. But I have to try this. If only on the outside chance that I might live one minute longer. And the, that minute could be that one minute that you need me when no one else will do. For I intend to struggle tooth and nail, so help me God, unquote. Some people can understand and relate to that. And so again, do you love God's word and keep God's commandments? Look at verses 2 and 3. Beginning in verse 2, it says, by this we know that the love of the... That, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. John is going to repeat the fact that people who love God obey God. And what are the commandments? Is this a reference to the Mosaic law? Is this, is this a reference to the Old Testament and the 613 laws that surrounded the Mosaic law? Or are these the commandments of Jesus? And I'm going to suggest to you that it isn't a reference to the Mosaic law. That it is, in fact, a reference to what he has already indicated, Jesus' commands. And what are Jesus' commands? That you love the Lord and that you love each other. The reason why I think that this is the case is because it says in verse 3, and his commandments are not burdensome, which is a different testimony that Peter gave in the book of Acts chapter 15 when it says, do we we, should we insist that the Gentiles become Jews in order to be Christians? Should we insist that they keep the laws of Moses when we ourselves never really kept them? And are we going to lay on them a burden that we ourselves couldn't keep? So I'm going to suggest to you that the, that the commandments that he's talking about are the commandments of Jesus. And this is what he's saying. Truth, love, and obedience are the ingredients that make 
Friendship and fellowship with God possible and friendship and fellowship with each other possible. John's anticipating the question, how do I know? How do I know that I'm really loving my brother and my sister? I know, I know, I know, I know that I'm supposed to love Christians. But I'm not really sure if I'm doing it. Again, we're forced to ask and answer the question, what does love mean here? Does it mean agreeing with everything that they say? Does it mean that you don't find them annoying any longer? Is it possible that you can love someone and not agree with them and find them occasionally annoying or even often annoying? So once again, we're forced to define what love means. And it's found, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and could be summed up in the simple statement, love is a willingness to do what's right for that person. Our obedience to God proves that we love God. That's John's argument. Our obedience to God proves that we love God. John reminds us that we love and we obey his commandments. Think about what he's saying. Again, Ray Steadman says, when love is expressed by righteousness, then we can be confident that it is really love, unquote. In other words, one of the ways that you really know, that you really know, that you really know that you're doing this right is when you look at another person and you begin to pray for them and you care about what happens to them and you're willing to do what's right towards them. And so in verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. That word burdensome is very interesting in the original language. It's bars. It's the verb form of the Greek word bareo. And what does that mean? It is a word that was used in that Greek world to describe a weight that you were carrying or that you feel weighed down. So burdensome here is the idea of carrying a weight that sometimes seems impossible to bear. And for some of you, you understand exactly what that means as you, as you bear the burden of a husband or a wife or a family or, or elderly parents or, or whatever it is, that, uh, some financial issue, some issue, you, you, you just become all of a sudden burdened. And so here, John says, and his commandments are not burdensome. They were never meant to weigh you down. They were never meant to bring you to a place where you felt like you couldn't go forward, where you feel the commands of God place too many restrictions, too many prohibitions, too limitations. And you go, I can't really do what God is asking me to do because it limits my freedom. It prohibits what I want to do. <coughs> it limits my fun. Let's just be honest. If I do this, I can't have fun. And so what John is basically saying is you really can't experience true life. Remember what I said by true life. I'm not talking about temporal life that will eventually end. I'm not talking about the presence of an animated life which could result in death at the, at the last day of your life. I'm talking about the kind of abundant life that Jesus speaks of because your sin has been forgiven and you really are in real relationship and fellowship with God. Some people feel that the commands of God place so many restrictions, prohibitions, and limitations that they can't do it. Let me put it another way. Has anyone ever asked you to lie for them? Has anyone ever asked you to cheat for them? Has anyone ever asked you to do something that you do was wrong and then they looked at you and they said, if you really loved me, you would do this for me. And you were afraid. 
It isn't just simply about knowing that it's wrong. You were afraid. You were afraid. You were afraid for a moment because, because they said that, that they might abandon the friendship or, or the fellowship or the relationship. In other words, they put the terms so high that you felt compelled that you had to do it in order to preserve the relationship. And what John is saying is the truth, the truth, the truth. If you really love someone, if you really love the Lord, and if you really love each other, you're unwilling to lie for each other. You're unwilling to cheat for each other. You're unwilling to lie because you know it's harmful and destructive. You're unwilling to cheat. You're unwilling to steal because you know that it's harmful and wrong. You are unwilling to do that which is wrong, that violates the character of God or the attributes of God or the revelation of God. And so you go, I want to tell the truth. And I want to tell the truth. And I don't want to have to worry about not having a friendship and a fellowship once I've told the truth. Does the truth sometimes offend? Today, I was at a store buying some tea. And the lady asked me, do you want a bag? I don't know, I can carry it. And she said, you'd be surprised how many people want a bag because they're lazy. And I said to her, can you imagine a world where you told the truth each and every time, no matter what? And she goes, that would just be mean. That would just be mean. In her world, she couldn't imagine a world where you told the truth and everything turned out okay. Lying is harmful and destructive. And sometimes the truth really does offend. But God invites us to speak the truth in love. Love may seem cruel at first, but our unwillingness to honor God or our unwillingness to obey God or our unwillingness to submit to God is evidence that we don't love Him. And our unwillingness to be honest with each other becomes fairly compelling reason to believe that maybe we still are struggling. We won't confront the problem. We don't want to offend. It's not love but hate that refuses the truth. Last week I had Josh McDowell on my radio program and he talked about he had this t-shirt that he made up that said, I am intolerant. And people would see that and they'd go, what kind of a horrible, wicked person are you? And then you turn around and the t-shirt says, Martin Luther King was intolerant of injustice. The t-shirt said, Bono is intolerant of AIDS. Mother Teresa is intolerant of poverty. And the people go, oh, okay, now I get it, now I get it. Disobedience always results in a loss of freedom. We may be very good at pointing out other people's faults and hiding our own. And so again, John says, do you really love the Lord? Do you really love each other? Have you overcome this present world? Look what it says in verse four, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. For whatever is born of God, that means born again, blood bought believer. For whatever is born of God, Christ confessing, cross bearing disciples. They have the certain characteristics. These are the traits. These are the spiritual markers. How can you tell the person's born again? The true believer from the make believer. How do you tell? John says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. In what sense? Remember the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, 
but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember what this world is. This world in this context is all of the philosophical beliefs that stand in opposition to the things of God and the person of God and the salvation of God. That's what he's talking about. The born again Christian believes the truth, obeys God's word, demonstrates love. So anyone who possesses those three things are born of God. They believe the truth. They obey the word. They demonstrate love. They're given power by God's Holy Spirit. For what purpose? To secure victory. And again, this victory is secured by faith. The victory is the result of faith. And here, again, we have to define faith. Faith is the belief and truth and confidence in what God says about himself and what God says about his character, what he says about his attributes, the promises that he makes, the revelation that is given. Faith that does not lead to love is meaningless, David Jackman says. Love is, that is not based on faith is powerless. This is good. Faith that doesn't lead to love is meaningless. Love that do, isn't based on faith is powerless. So he's not talking about some, again, some empty idea that may or may not be true. He's talking about a confident realization that results in an ability to do something different and be someone different. Faith isn't theatrics. It isn't sweating evangelists, waving a handkerchief, saying glory. That's not what is being spoken of here. So what does it mean to overcome the world? We have victory over the world. Overcome, by the way, is one of John's favorite words. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, John makes reference to overcoming the devil. He uses the word overcome seven times in the book of Revelation. To describe believers and the blessings that they receive. This isn't some sort of super anointed, spirit filled, super Christian who is different from the normal Christian. All of the implication seems to be this is the garden variety Christian. This isn't the Christian who has his own television show or radio program. This isn't a full time Christian worker. This isn't a person who's devoted themselves unrelentingly to the things of God. This is just the normal person who loves God. The story is told of a soldier in the army of Alexander the Great. He was accused of being a coward. Again, in the third century BC, uh, Alexander has made his way across the Hellespont. He's come into the area of modern Turkey. He's marching towards India. There was this particular person in a particular battle who, who was seen retreating, who was lagging behind when he was supposed to be pushing forward. And when Alexander approached him, the general said, what is your name? And the soldier said, sir, I share your name. My name is Alexander. And Alexander said, either you march forward or you change your name. That's part of what, what John is saying. Christian, you are a Christian. You are a Christ lover. You love the Lord. You love each other. You are the overcomer. And by the way, Nike is from the root word Nikeo, which means victory. And again, the tense that's used conveys the meaning of a singular victory. Lloyd Ogilvy says, quote, an exciting insight is inherent in the study of these words. The victory of Christ over Satan and death and sin is a single victory in time. Our acceptance of Christ as Savior and Lord makes his victory our victory. We've overcome the world. Again, the tense. We've overcome the wor world once and for all. Why? Because we believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus and that means we live forever. In his book, Forever Triumphant, F.J. Wagel told a story that came out of World War II. After General Jonathan Wainwright was captured by the Japanese, he was taken prisoner into a Manchurian prison camp, which is a Chinese camp. He was cruelly treated. He became, quote, a broken, crushed, hopeless, starving man, unquote. 
Finally, the Japanese surrendered and the war was over and a United States Army colonel was sent to, to the camp to announce personally to the general that Japan had been defeated, that he was free, and that he was in command. And after Wainwright heard the news, he returned to his quarters and he was confronted by some of the guards who had mistreated him earlier. And Wainwright, having just freshly heard the news of the Allied victory, it was still in his mind. He simply said to them, no, I'm in command here. And these are my orders. Hegel observed that from that moment on, General Wainwright was in control. And Hegel made this application. He said, have you ever been informed of the victory that you have in your savior on the greatest conflict of the ages? He says, then rise up and assert your rights. No, Jesus is the king. No, Jesus is the Lord. No, Jesus has achieved victory over the devil. No, I've been given eternal life. Claim the victory. We have to learn, he says, to stand on resurrection ground, reckoning dead the old creation which Satan has power. We need to be able to say, that's not who I am. That isn't why Christ saved me to continue to be the person that I used to be. As we mature and grow and show love and believe the scriptures and obey, obey the scriptures, we overcome. You know, there was an enthusiastic believer in Christ named Dan Richards, and he lost his battle with cancer. But his life demonstrated that even though the physical body was destroyed by disease, the spirit was triumphant. He really believed with all of his heart that even though the outward man was perishing, the inward man was being renewed day by day. And this poem was handed out at his memorial service. It read, cancer is so limited, it can't cripple love. It cannot shatter hope. It cannot corrode faith. It cannot eat away peace. It cannot destroy confidence. It cannot kill friendship. It cannot shut out memories. It cannot silence courage. It cannot invade the soul. It cannot reduce eternal life. It cannot quench the spirit. It cannot lessen the power of the resurrection. Things temporary and physical life, it can end. But eternal things go on forever and ever Ever. You know, you could just as easily transpose that word cancer to any other thing in your life that is temporary and can't last. And so, here's what John is telling you you're born again. You have everything that you need to love the Lord and to love each other and obtain the victory. Isn't that good? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that every single person listening to my voice right now fall into one of those two categories. They're born again or they're not. They've experienced that thing called life. They have believed with all of their heart that Jesus is the Lord and that God raised him from the dead. But for reasons perhaps unknown, they've continued to live a life of emptiness and sorrow and repeated defeat. 
Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, like General Wainwright in that prison, having heard the news that the war is over and that we won, can embrace all of the promises that have been given by God in Christ to walk, to love, to live, to grow. So that even though we may have been despised and persecuted and mocked and ridiculed, that we can remember that Jesus has called us to live a life marked by truth and righteousness, faith, love, and obedience to Christ. In Jesus' name. And again, if for whatever reason you fall into that other category of a person who's never been born again, you've never experienced that, all of this seems so crazy to you. I pray that just for a moment, you would consider that God has brought you here so that you could hear the truth and understand the truth. That you would believe the invitation that the Holy Spirit is extending to you to confess your sin and walk away from it and receive this new life, this new power, this new hope in Jesus. And that you could pray just a simple prayer. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I, I want to be forgiven. And I want to love you and trust you and walk with you. I want to believe the truth. I don't want to live a lie anymore. I want Jesus to be my Lord and I want to understand and grow in him. And I believe by faith that God sent Jesus and that he died on the cross for my sins and that he rose from the dead and that because he's alive, because he's really alive in the truest sense of what that word means that I can be alive and I can live forever. And so I trust him right now to be my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And if that's you, you prayed that prayer and you mean that prayer, the Bible says that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and that you have been born again. Let's stand.